very happy to be on the CBU campus for the first time, um, not too far away from UCLA. Uh, so learning from your mistakes um, and adjusting in response to both positive and negative outcomes is a, a cognitive process that is likely very important in the addiction process. So it seems uh, intuitive that this cognitive process is something that you developmentally refine, that is um, that you get better at doing with age, so learning from your mistakes. However, what's less intuitive is how direct experience with a drug like methamphetamine uh, can actually affect this cognitive process in a very long-lasting off-drug way uh, and subvert your ability to stay clean. So subvert essentially any abstinence plans. So learning from your mistakes and uh, observing sort of the, the outcomes, so both positive, neg ne positive and negative feedback. So if you engage in a behavior, it results in a reward, great, you're, you're likely to repeat that behavior again. If you, however, engage in a behavior and it results in either a punishment or no reward, it's most adaptive to shift your behavior and adjust uh, future behavior, right? And so this learning from your mistakes and learning from your successes is something that is sort of under the umbrella term of performance monitoring. So performance monitoring um, has a developmental trajectory. So this is something that, for example, is poor in aging. So you don't actually need to have neurodegenerative uh, disorder on board. This is just something that you see developmental and um, decrements in aging uh, in the normal person. Uh, you also see that performance monitoring is poor in youth. Uh, so this is particularly true in those with disruptive behavior history such as conduct disorder. And uh, younger but not older adults, so even within adulthood, you have um, decrements in the older adults in learning from salient feedback. So if you're given feedback about your performance, younger adults are better at adjusting their behavior. And I should also point out that optimal learners, learners with steeper learning curves that learn quickly, learn best from negative feedback, not from positive feedback. So we know, actually, the neurobiological mechanisms are very well worked out for this kind of executive function. Uh, we know that it occurs via signals in the prefrontal cortex. Within the prefrontal cortex, you have different subregions that are important in error detection, reward valuation. Um, and this also depends on, and we know a lot of this from animal research, it depends on signaling between prefrontal cortex and basal ganglia structures, and you've heard a lot about this from doctors Hurd and Kono. Um, so we have further evidence that this is likely dopaminergic. So dopaminergic drugs, Parkinsonian patients actually are better at learning from their mistakes on a, on a performance monitoring task if they're on their meds. If they're off their meds, they're, they perform suboptimally. So we actually have evidence of this last point and further evidence that dopaminergic modulation of performance monitoring is indeed the case. Uh, work by uh, my student Alex Stolyarova found that long after methamphetamine exposure, uh, you see changes in the strategies that animals use to learn from their mistakes. So you actually get a shift from, um, and this was uh, recently published uh, in behavioral brain research, where we found that animals shift from uh, learning from mistakes to positive feedback learning. So they make more, um, more gains from positive feedback learning. And this is long-lasting off-drug uh, changes. We know that poor performance monitoring and addictions manifest in a circuitous relationship. So we, and this again um, falls on um, animal research, that we're able to study sort of the mechanisms of by which this occurs. So poor performance monitoring likely contributes to a quicker escalation from recreational use to compulsive drug use. And I'm showing you here not just substance addictions, right, but uh, behavioral addictions. So I think the, the same, um, the neurobiological mechanisms, mechanisms by which this can occur are very similar, or they, they're overlapping. And we also know that increasing history more experience with a drug, a drug like methamphetamine, can then feed back and um, contribute to poor performance monitoring. So it's this sort of vicious cycle that um, exacerbates uh, the addiction process. 
So addiction probably has a cognitive endophenotype. In fact, there are several that have been, have been developed for addiction. Impulsivity is one. Um, and there have been other cognitive endophenotypes developed for schizophrenia and ADHD. And these are a group of behavioral or physical characteristics that represent a vulnerability to a particular disorder. And so if you were able to identify these features, you can identify individuals that are more likely um, to, when they do uh, fall victim to addiction, that it's more severe and they're more likely to relapse. So the vulnerability to relapse would be higher in those individuals if you were to identify this cognitive marker. So we believe, we propose um, that a strong cognitive novel and a phenotype uh, for psychostimulant addiction is performance monitoring. And we measure this in a number of ways. Um, one way that we've been, um, that has paid off for us in terms of uh, uh, data is trial by trial analyses of discrimination reversal learning. And so we use rats in our lab. So, and since I have quite a bit of data showing um, results from this task, I'm just gonna tell you very briefly, it's a very simple task. Um, and you're seeing here a mouse, but we use rats in our research. You present the, um, the rat with two stimuli to discriminate. So in, oops. In this case, um, the rat has to nose poke the stimulus to get a reward. And the animal just gets a food reward if it nose pokes correctly. Uh, in some cases, obviously, the other one is rewarded. But in this case, it's that sort of marble-shaped stimulus. So imagine that the animal then reaches a very strict criterion, 85% correct across two consecutive days, and then you switch it. So now the stimula stimulus that used to produce the reward, that when that nose poke occurred would, re would result in a food reward, is now no longer the rewarded one, and uh, this stimulus instead is the rewarded one. And even though you're not punishing the animal, Animals find it sufficiently aversive enough to avoid making that response because they get a timeout and they can't get another chance for, for a reward. So you can imagine that when you switch the, the reward contingencies, there's a real decrease in the percent correct. So actually well below chance because they're responding according to this rule. So we actually know that, um, and this is, not just our lab has collected these data. Um, there are, uh, the Yench lab has also um, collected a lot of data on reversal learning after psychostimulant exposure. But we have found that brief or chronic methamphetamine exposure selectively impairs reversal learning in adulthood. And this is not on drug, but off drug. So the animals undergo a withdrawal period, you test them weeks later, and you see this impairment in adulthood. And what I'm showing you here is a very selective effect after a binge dose, and actually humans tend to um, escalate their use and um, two binge uh, runs. And so this models sort of a subneurotoxic dose of methamphetamine. You can see there's a selective impairment on early reversal learning. This is percent correct. And we have found that even um, a single dose exposure or escalating dose exposure across weeks produces a very similar selective effect on reversal learning. You can see that here on um, the right panel uh, compared to pretreatment uh, discrimination learning. So it's a very selective effect and it doesn't really matter how much, how much the an animal has been exposed to uh, that methamphetamine, whether it's a single dose or many, many days. You get a very selective effect. So of course, most of our research has uh, focused up until recently on the adult animal and, and um, cognitive effects resulting from meth exposure. So we had, um, of course, there's very good precedent for understanding what happens in the adolescent brain. You see pronounced neurodevelopmental changes in prefrontal cortex and striatal limbic regions. You see changes in dopaminergic signaling, and this is just in the normal adolescent, if there is such a thing. Um, and you have 1.4 million documented users, new users of methamphetamine, 12, 12 years of age or, and older, 
um, and this is, was particularly important and interesting to us as we uh, are interested in the effects, long-lasting effects of methamphetamine. So you already know that these are going on in the adolescent brain, uh, but superimposed on that are meth effects, um, but also that these neural substrates are critical to discrimination and reversal learning. So you can uh, consider this as a, a possible assay for if things are going right in the brain. So in studying um, adolescent exposure, uh, we, very, very similar to um, what you've uh, heard before in terms of uh, postnatal day uh, 20-ish exposed exposure. So we exposed animals from postnatal day 20, uh, sorry, 40 to 51, so it's mid to late adolescence, waited some time, uh, and then trained them on the discrimination reversal learning task. And you can see that as opposed to the, the learning, the selective reversal learning impairment that you see in, uh, in adult exposure, after adult exposure, you see a robust learning impairment after adolescent methamphetamine exposure. So again, I reiterate that the impairment actually is off drug many weeks after last dose exposure. And you can see that it's not just reversal learning, even though you see a, a pretty um, robust main effect here of treatment uh, with sessions to criterion, uh, very different. Uh, there are many more sessions needed to reach criterion after meth exposure. Um, but you also see this, and surprising to us, this discrimination reversal learning, uh, discrimination impairment. So we worked with uh, Tamara Phillips at OHSU um, to assess in adulthood, how much animals would consume the drug uh, if given the opportunity. And so we actually worked out an oral self-administration uh, paradigm where um, animals were given in their home cage uh, the opportunity to drink meth. So we give, gave them uh, access to meth versus water um, and observed some, uh, I guess, pretty expected um, differences, given what we've talked about already um, today, that adolescent exposure led to heightened sampling of methamphetamine later in adulthood. And you can see that they consume much more meth. We don't think that it's um, a taste difference because actually meth has a bitter taste in water. This is quinine, it's a bitter taste in control. They didn't uh, consume that any more than the saline treated animals. So we do think that they're drinking the meth for the meth effects. So adolescents exposed to methamphetamine drink more meth in adulthood. They have robust learning impairments. What was more surprising to us, which was actually more exciting to us, was that adolescent learning is predictive of consumption of methamphetamine in adulthood. So what you see is a strong positive linear relationship with uh, learning sessions to criterion, both for discrimination and reversal learning, and consumption. So I know that this learning score was obtained in adolescence around postnatal day 55, and this consumption measure was measured 115 days plus, um, it, well into adulthood. So ongoing experiments in my lab are aimed at validating this with IV self-administration, which is a model uh, with more face validity to how humans actually use. So in summary, meth pretreatment significantly impairs reversal learning as in adults. We weren't terribly surprised by that. Um, but also discrimination learning. And what that shows us is that even modest, not binge neurotoxic level exposure to methamphetamine during late adolescence induces robust and general learning impairments. Rats pre-exposed to methamphetamine in adolescence consume more meth in adulthood. And more importantly, learning around postnatal day 50, which is adolescence, uh, is predictive of methamphetamine consumption in postnatal day 100 plus. So we, th we think that this is strong support for a cognitive endophenotype of psychostimulant addiction. And so now we can use this marker as a somewhat of a diagnostic or a predictor for um, relapse potential. 
And some of our ongoing uh, interventions uh, that we're trying out is really targeting inflammation and microglial activation. And you can see here that meth has a, there's a confluence of factors, complex confluence of factors that really um, impact meth's effects on the brain. So you have oxidative stress, many of which you've heard about today, oxidative stress, environmental stress, excitotoxicity, mitochondrial dysfunction. One sort of common denominator seems to be the inflammatory processes in the brain, such as microglial activation. And so we're asking the questions now, how is the younger versus older brain differentially susceptible or resilient to methamphetamine? When do you optimally introduce these behavioral or pharmacological interventions to mitigate learning, uh, the learning impairment and reduce the likelihood to relapse? And one very promising um, avenue that we've investigated, and this is um, Andrew Thompson in the lab, has an SFN uh, poster this, uh, this fall showing that if you take the animals um, at past the acute withdrawal period and you put them and you give them access to volunteer, uh, voluntary wheel running, they actually will run more, uh, much more than saline treated animals. Uh, and it normalizes markers of striatal dopamine and frontal cortical inflammation um, after uh, chronic meth uh, exposure. And this is work that is in collaboration with uh, Fernando Gomez Pinilla uh, at UCLA. So I'd like to acknowledge my students, Tony Yi, Andrew Thompson, Alex, and uh, Stolyarova, and all of the UCLA and Cal State LA undergrads, and uh, funding and collaborators, and thank you all for listening. I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Alicia. Do uh, one question. That was really nice. And I have a, because the prediction is not very, I mean, it's significant, I'm wondering if you can put other things in the model mm -hmm. and therefore you're gonna build that true cognitive phenotype, um, endophenotype by looking at different things. How did reversal, if you would now add reversal learning there as a prediction in addition to discrimination, do you improve the, that prediction? We haven't looked at that. Yeah, so I would together. Exactly. I would try right. and build like that an model. Index. Exactly. We'll do that. Thank you, Yasmin. Hi, thank you. Um, just a quick question. Can, uh, can this be uh, applied to other stimulants and does it have any implications for ADHD? That's a really good question. We're looking at methylphenidate exposure as well. Um, there is some evidence that, that uh, methylphenidate and um, other ADHD medications impact reversal learning. Uh, but our test is, they're slightly different assays across labs. So that's one of the sort of the challenges is that you have different behavioral paradigms. Uh, but I would say that it's very likely that you would have, um, that you would have that relationship across the psychostimulants. Thank you very much, Alicia.